this is a convening. Um, this is a convening to bring people together who are concerned about depolarization with people who work on these issues on a daily basis, um, um, as you've seen across the different panel discussions. Um, over the past couple of years, people have been not only doing research around this, they've been building toolkits. Um, they've been putting together um, um, resources so that it reaches local communities who are wanting to do this work um, on the on the, on the local level. Um, and for example, like Neelan's group has a has a um, monitor um, that goes out once a week that lets you know about the different both. Um, 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 organizations that are doing peace related work and some of the hot spots around the country. Um, and so one of the first things we wanted to do here was to um, um, make the feedback loop better and stronger and open it up. And that was the first step. Like we're all about the steps that we take and to see then where we were in terms of the level of interest here. And it sounds like there's a lot of, of interest. So what we'll wanna do next is go back um, and talk about what our next steps will be and then communicate that to you. And in the meantime, we're gonna be sharing with you after this an email that has all of the different resources that our different panelists have put together and that have also been placed in the chat box because I would be surprised if everybody was catching all of those links <laughs> Um, given everything that's been going on. And then we also have like, for example, at Millions of Conversations, which I'll talk about at the end, we have a conversationalist series. And so there are a lot of different things that are already exist in the ecosystem for everyone to tap into, but there's still much more work to be done. And the ecosystem is not complete in its development phase. And so we do want to put together, as you, I think that's a great suggestion, these working groups and think through how best to organize those so that they're efficient and they're effective. Um, and that is, and I'll repeat some of that at the end, but we're right at the three o'clock Eastern Standard Time mark of where we are going to have our concluding remarks um, in the last 30 minutes. So we have the opportunity here to um, hear from Dr. Jonathan Metzl, um, and then also Mr. Bob Boister, who is the um, um, president and CEO of the Fetzer Institute, and then Mike and I will conclude um, this summit. So without further ado, let me just introduce to you um, Dr. Jonathan Metzl, who um, is uh, representing Vanderbilt here today. He is a professor um, at Vanderbilt University. He's the director of the Department of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University. He also just wrote the book, Dying of Whiteness, which you might've heard about, um, which he'll talk to us a little bit about, which is about how the politics of racial resentment is killing America's heartland and these different focus groups that he's done over the past couple of years. And how he really has been, and he also, I should note, is a psychiatrist and he also has a PhD in American culture. Um, and so he has been studying American culture for the past several decades and right now, most of his work is focused on why we're so divided and what we do about it. Well, thank you so much. I, 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 it's been such a great day. I've been in the back just previously uh, writing down notes and everything. So I'm glad you're going to put the chat out because there were so many incredible ideas. And as you'll see, so many interlinks between things that everybody is working on. Uh, my work, which I'll tell you about over the next 10 minutes, um, really looks at uh, how it's, it's kind of getting back to some of the themes that we heard about earlier this morning, how racial scripts, and for me, particularly narratives of kind of white racial resentment, this kind of uh, concern about undeserving immigrants and minorities, and this kind of white racial anxiety, um, really um, flares up at times when we should all be working together, um, but, it, but instead we, um, you know, we, we tend to divide each other. And really how, in my argument, you, know, you really have to understand how race functions in the United States in order to address those moments. Now, we certainly have had a number of moments where you could think that it, it kind of the, the traditional moment is kind of crisis, then come together for resolution. And, and we've had that um, so often recently. I mean, certainly the election felt like a particular kind of denouement um, and it's kind of like, okay, look, we, we, we went over to the abyss and then we came together and let's start building back together. But instead it became a moment of more polarization. And um, I, I, I just had a piece come out, I just posted in the chat about how instead of uh, creating a kind of unity of now we can all work together, it became a moment that engendered particular forms of, of a particular form of white anxiety that we're seeing to continue. But it's not the only one we've seen over the course of, of, the, of the past couple of months. Um, certainly uh, in a different planet, on a different universe, if the leader of your country living in the safest house in the country um, has the coronavirus, you would think, man, if he can get it, everybody else can, let's all come together. And this is, should be a wake up call. But instead that was a moment that became a polarization of the virus itself early on in the pandemic. 
uh, there was this moment um, where it was pretty clear that there was going to be not just a medical crisis, but also an economic crisis. And at that point, too, we should have all said, let's all come together and give everybody health care and, and some kind of wage to get everybody through this together. But instead, it became a moment where we fell back on old time polarizing po uh, politics. Certainly, uh, the protests this summer um, could have been a moment where we said Americans are suffering and people need to be taken care of and, need, and we need to do better and build infrastructures and equity and safety for people, but instead it again became this moment of polarization. And for me, really, that's the story of my work is how at moments of crisis, um, we, we really have, we need trust in institutions and infrastructures that work the best for everyone. And instead, what we've seen is an erosion in those particular um, institutions. And there are a lot of different reasons why that's happened. Many great uh, narratives that have come out of uh, the conversations today about how that has broken down that kind of governance and trust and, and sense of national unity. But for me, it, also, it often comes back to this kind of racial tensions about um, what Du Bois called kind of the unresolved conflicts of the color line in the United States and the ways in which these racial and racializing wounds have never really fully been addressed and it creates this kind of racializing tension. Now, I'm somebody, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri and I've, I've seen us do a lot better. There were a lot of problems in the Kansas City that I grew up in, but uh, there were all these common community structures. Um, everybody would send their kids to taxpayer funded public camps in the summer um, and you'd meet all kinds of people and you would kind of get along and you know we'd make friends uh, across political, ideological, racial, ethnic divides, um, the whole city kind of felt an investment in that, in that kind of investment in infrastructure. And so there were all these kind of common investments in places that people came together when I was growing up. And it was mirrored in the political structure of Kansas City, where at least uh, through the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, when there were close political elections, instead of having one party won and another party lose, uh, there were mechanisms for power sharing agreements where they would, for example, rotate the chairmanships of key uh, of key uh, chair of, of key committees so that everybody got to got their say in a representative democracy. And unfortunately, what I saw happen in Kansas City, my parents still live there, is the rise of this kind of uh, aggrieved politics that basically said, "I'm not paying tax into communal structures." Also linked to um, hyper um, militarization and guns, which made community structures unsafe. And it really upended all of these common structures. And that's, the, that's kind of the framework that I take um, with my work I, I, uh, in dying of whiteness. In dying of whiteness, I go to Tennessee around the time that the Affordable Care Act is coming out. And this is an important time because Tennessee is having worse and worse and worse health comes, outcomes about everything you can think of. Uh, there was a collapse of a program called TenCare. Um, and as that was happening, the state had worse cardiovascular disease, worse diabetes, worse obesity, worse infant mortality. And as that was happening, all of a sudden down the pike, um, there's a public health crisis at the time. And along the way comes the Affordable Care Act, which for me was almost the precursor to the pandemic moment. And uh, my colleagues and I did research around um, 2011, 12, 13 about the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act had a lot of promise for a place like Tennessee because it was promising pre-prevention, public health. It was offering consumer protections. Even in its first iteration, it was basically solving um, this crisis that Tennessee was having. It was giving the exact answer. Now, of course, there were a lot of problems with it, but we went around and we just did focus groups with, uh, with people around the Affordable Care Act and looked at um, higher income men, middle income men, and lower income men. I'm going to tell you about just real quickly. Uh, and we'd say, how do you guys feel about this? Basically, you're going to get free, free health care from this program. And initially, maybe for the first three or four months, everybody was on board. They would say, this is awesome. I've never had health care before. I'm really excited about this. This sounds fantastic. Um, but then there were these racializing scripts that played out, just like what we've seen with um, you know, with masks and with the pandemic itself about, oh no, it's just big government overreach. And it really played out along racial lines. When we would ask African-American men who benefits from healthcare reform, again and again, these men would say, and these were medically ill, poor black men would say, I think everybody benefits from getting healthcare reform. Everyone as a society, because we all do by having people insured. These are the kind of answers we would get from black men. And they were remarkable answers because when you're building a national healthcare system, those are the kind of answers you want people to give. Like the more the merrier, let's bring everybody on board. But, but when we would talk to white men, uh, we would say who benefits from healthcare reform. And these really, really medically ill men would basically say, yeah, I'm sick. Yeah, I need some healthcare but I'm not going to sign up for a program, even if it's going to save my life, literally save my life. Um, because as this uh, one gentleman said, 
ain't no way I want my tax dollars helping Mexicans or welfare queens. We heard that kind of story over and over and over again, that even though this program might benefit me, I'm not gonna go to a program that's gonna be gamed by undeserving racial others. And that really is the story of the work I do, how these unsolved, unaddressed racial narratives in the United States uh, really cause death. I mean, in this, the men I spoke with, particularly the white men, many of them actually did pass away over the three years of the research um, of chronic untreated medical illness that would have been much better had they signed up for the Affordable Care Act, which they refused to do. And so the story of the book really is one about how um, these men were dying of two things. On one hand, they were dying of untreated chronic medical illness, and they were also dying of an ideology, this idea that there were privileges that were due to them as white Americans, and I have to say the most powerful part of all these stories was the story about austerity, this idea that there's not enough health care to go around and these undeserving immigrants and minorities. I just, I just, the whole time I did my research, I kept saying, I just want to tell you there's plenty to go around. Everybody will have enough. But, that, but this idea that we're being gamed by the system and it led to these outcomes where not just these men, but the entire state refused to uh, expand Medicaid and it led to these horrific outcomes. And for people who know the book, of course, this narrative had horrific um, out implications for minoritized communities who didn't get insured. Um, but because states like Tennessee, for example, are largely you know, dominant uh, uh, white states, about 79% uh, white, um, on an aggregate level, the biggest loss of life from not expanding the Affordable Care Act was white men who on average lost about five weeks of, of their life. And so in a way, this became the kind of trade-off narrative of my, of my research. And I'm inspired by um, some of the work we've heard before about zero-sum formulations of race. I do a lot of work with Du Bois and this idea that basically people should join common cause across, um, you know, when they have common interests, um, but they don't do so because of this unresolved wage of whiteness, which I think upends many of the narratives, even the ones we were just talking about in the conversation, if we're not sensitive to, to the race underlying racial themes. And in the work, I look at guns and tell a similar story about, about guns, uh, and I look at, at education also. I interview a bunch of parents who were supporting budget cuts to their own kids' schools because they thought that the black school districts were gaming the system, and how ultimately their kids became among the kids who suffered disproportionately dropout rates and things like that. And so just in my last two minutes here, I'll say that the lessons of my research are really, and, and I take this pretty empathically, I mean, it's a, it's a moment of terror, it's a moment of scarcity, and I think that all of, all of the all the mechanisms in the world kind of tell people we can we can build a healthcare system just for our group, but not for the other group. We can build an electoral system just for our group, but not for the other group. And ultimately, democracies fell apart that way. It doesn't work that way. We're all connected, and either we build systems that work for everybody, or we all go down the tubes together. Um, another, uh, this comes out of my work in Kansas. I, I studied how it took them about 60 or 70 years to build the Kansas public health uh, the public school system. It went from like the number 40 school system to the number six school system in the country. And it was very incremental. Actually, centrists came together and every year they just put a little bit of money in and expand AP classes, do education, all these kind of things. 60, 70 years of progress, it all got wiped out in two years of budget cuts. And so it's very hard to build systems that are commun communal systems. It's very easy to destroy them. And we were talking before about identities, and I can't say that enough that many of these issues, I was studying guns, for example, and people would like invite me into their homes to show how, um, you know, they had guns in their headboard, they had guns around their Christmas tree and stuff like that. It wasn't about gun policy at that moment. It was about how the issues themselves, healthcare, guns, et cetera, became symbols of identity. And you're not just going to swoop in and say, let's get some good gun policy if you don't address the identity there. Um, and in my last 30 seconds, I'll just say that, um, you know, really, I think that so many, uh, so many conversations are important individually, um, but ultimately these conversations have to also be aligned with structural change. If we don't change structures that allow people to cooperate and not compete, that we're going to just keep, I think, replaying the same, the same system. And ultimately for me, this is a conversation about um, whiteness and how we have this hierarchical notion of whiteness um, and um, uh, this hierarchical notion of whiteness in, in this country. Um, and ultimately, we need to figure out ways to make that more horizontal, new ways of talking across the divide and imagining shared futures together, or to quote the former Congressman uh, Steve King and, and many people here, we're, we're in line for uh, much more divisiveness. So that is it. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and now we have Mr. Bob Boister, who is the, the president and CEO of um, the Fetzer Institute. Bob, are you with us? Yes, I am. Great, uh, thank you, you so much. Great. Uh, well, if, uh, first off, I want to say uh, uh, a huge uh, gratitude to every, uh, particularly our organizers and presenters. Uh, this has been an incredibly rich day of uh, you know, talking about uh, the problem of polarization from lots of different important and uh, complementary perspectives. Uh, and as Sharif uh, hinted at the beginning, I, I want to bring uh, yet another perspective into the remarks I'll make in the next few minutes. And that is uh, the uh, importance, uh, I would say, from my perspective, of, of going deeper uh, in terms of thinking about the moral and spiritual dimension of this challenge of polarization. Uh, one of the themes running through a number of the comments has been, well, how bad is this? One alarm fire, five alarm fire. Uh, I'll tip my hand and say I'm definitely in the five alarm fire uh, uh, camp. Uh, the uh, I think back to a book uh, that uh, uh, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein from Brookings and AEI published a few years ago called It's Even Worse Than It Looks. Uh, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, I feel like we're dealing with polarization that has been driven by deeply uh, entrenched inexorable, seemingly inexorable forces over the last several decades. Uh, the big sort uh, that Bill Bishop has talked about, the uh, alignment of meta identities that Ezra Klein talks about. Uh, and so this, this problem feels to me a lot like climate change. Uh, it's a problem that is being driven by these deeply entrenched forces proceeding incrementally downward over a long period of time. But like climate, uh, where the specialists tell us that at a certain point it stops being incremental and becomes a radical phase shift. I think uh, if we stay on our current trajectory, uh, uh, our system will fail. No one knows when, uh, but I think that, uh, at least that's my assessment. Let me tell you uh, kind of how I get there, I'll say two things about my personal perspective. One is that I, I've had uh, over my entire life, uh, really the blessing of going regularly back and forth between red and blue America uh, when I'm not traveling, which I really miss. Uh, I, my wife and I divide our time between Arlington, Virginia, uh, where 82% of our uh, neighbors voted for Biden, uh, and a rural county, uh, Rockingham County, about 100 miles west, where 70% went for Trump. And what I'm struck as I move back and forth is the complete failure of understanding across that red-blue divide. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time working with faith groups uh, in the two weeks before the election. Uh, I had conversations on either side uh, that included the sentence, I can't understand how a Christian could vote for X or Y. Uh, second, uh, a word about my professional history. Uh, I've been in this job with Fetzer since 2013, but for the prior 25 years, uh, I worked uh, on the center left side of civil society in Washington, uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, advocacy and civic participation. Uh, I come to that with a passion for democracy and community level involvement. Uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s, I spent a number of years uh, leading an effort, uh, uh, quite successful effort to start a grassroots national advocacy program in uh, the, the national YMCA where we uh, had local wise uh, in a bottom up process uh, uh, prioritize issues and then we went to lobby and uh, we had good success. We uh, helped pass the, the child care development block grant, uh, the Juvenile Justice Act. But the longer I stayed at that work through the 90s and the, this, uh, this new millennium, uh, my lived experience was the breakdown of our capacity for common action. Uh, 
both sides got better and better at uh, uh, mobilizing their teams, galvanizing their supporters by demonizing the other side. Uh, and uh, we see where that has led. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a long-term phenomenon being driven by deeply entrenched forces across our uh, higher education, civil society, pretty much every major sector. And we do a lot of work at Fetzer around civil discourse, around bridging, uh, and I, you know, it's important work. We have to do it. But my uh, candid assessment is that these regenerative initiatives are just not powerful enough to overcome the forces that are pulling us apart and pulling us down which leads me to uh, suggest that uh, we're living through uh, a time of uh, not only breakdown in our democracy, but multiple system failure across healthcare, education, criminal justice, the family. Now, think about your computer. If you woke up one morning and Word and Outlook and Excel and Google were all not working, uh, you could say, okay, well, it was bad luck. They all developed independent bugs at the same time, but you'd more likely say, wow, something is wrong with my operating system. Uh, and that's what I want to suggest, that uh, both our personal operating system and our cultural operating system, which after all is just the sum of all of our personal operating systems, uh, seems to me to have a fundamental defect. We are programmed to engage with each other uh, fundamentally from uh, a position of separation of as atomized individuals and separate groups. Uh, we're, uh, as the evolutionary biologists tell us, deeply programmed for in-group, out-group, for uh, fight or flight. We process information with a strong confirmation bias. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we're also program to claim the best version of ourselves and our group and project the worst version uh, of the other group. Uh, so I, I just like to leave you with the thought that uh, maybe what we need uh, is a fundamentally different operating system in terms of the values that, that animate us at the individual level, at the community level, at the national level. Uh, and this is where we at Fetzer have uh, the, uh, uh, the mission of helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world uh, that lifts up these two uh, powerful and powerfully related concepts of love and spirituality. Uh, love because we think it is the only human impulse powerful enough to overcome uh, all the things that are pulling us apart and pulling us down. Uh, and spiritual because we think the uh, the challenge of profoundly opening our hearts in love to each other is best understood as a fundamental challenge. It's way deeper than cognition. Uh, it is uh, it, 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 taking on the challenge that Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I think, framed when he, in his Gulag Archipelago, based on all of his experience in the Gulag, wrote, the line between good and evil does not run between nations or between political parties, but through every human heart. Uh, and he went on to say that the fundamental spiritual challenge for each of us is the expunge evil, uh, nonetheless doing everything to weaken its hold on our, our way of being and our way of acting. Uh, and so that, uh, and I think we do that by, uh, by just saying, uh, we have to engage uh, at the deep level where the natural language is to talk, uh, not about civil discourse about or bridging, but about love. Uh, so I'd like to offer very quickly my operating definition of love, which has two parts. One is to wanna be in relationship, to wanna be in, uh, if you will, communion which starts with trying to understand as deeply as I possibly can the other, whether that's my wife and my kids or uh, the folks across uh, the red-blue divide. 
Uh, and second, after understanding, it seems to me it involves a commitment to the flourishing of the other, uh, a recognition of their sacred dignity and an all-in commitment to build a society that works for all of us. Uh, and that leads in some very interesting directions. Uh, it leads to a cultural conversation about what's a flourishing human being look like anyway, where I think we realize it's way deeper than material satisfaction. Uh, it leads to a conversation about who's not flourishing, which is just another way of framing all the conversations we need to have about equity and justice. Uh, and it, it leads uh, to the conversation about how we can each do the deep inner work uh, to make uh, the most powerful contribution we can to building uh, a, a society and a world based on love. Uh, I'll just close by taking a big, big step back. Um, what, if, you, if I look at the story of the last several centuries uh, of the human journey, I say, we have become tremendously more powerful as a species by virtue of our science and technology. And we've gotten a lot of good out of that. But I think what we're realizing is that we have not at the same time become correspondingly more loving, more compassionate, more committed to justice. Uh, and that's the story that ends badly because it has an overwhelming likelihood that uh, we use that ever growing power destructively. Uh, and uh, there's a better ending uh, but it depends on playing catch-up ball spiritually uh, to where we use that power uh, in love for the flourishing of all. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, our, that's our Fetzer take, that's my take, uh, and uh, do with it what you will. But thank you very much for listening and for your participation today. Well, thank you, Bob. And honestly, that's the human take, if I may be so bold <laughs> to say. I don't think that's that's only the Fetzer take. Um, I, I just think, as you said, like that is that is at the essence of what it means to be human. Um, and, um, and, and I know Nisi's on here as well, and she helps with us run this program called um, the Engine for Art, Democracy, and Justice, which is actually talks about the power of love um, to heal these divides. Um, and at the at that very you know, um, local level, which keeps coming up as well about these, these, when we talk, we're talking about these local communities and we're finding that it really is, it does, it is about um, going local and, and starting from there and building from there. And from there you can go national and you can go global, but you can't go global without being local. Um, and, and there's just, I, I just everything you said was beautiful, so thank you. And um, I want to invite Mike to come back with me now as we make our closing remarks here um, and what has been just a phenomenal um, day of um, rich information and dialogue that I know is just the beginning of many more to come amongst all of us. Um, and we are the week before Thanksgiving here in a year that has been in many ways unprecedented. Um, so we are gonna exhale. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to exhale um, and enjoy their time with family, um, the, the, the small family units that we'll be gathering with around Thanksgiving and to enjoy this holiday season, to know that when we come back in in 2021, we're gonna have to roll our sleeves up and we have a lot of work to do. And as I said at the beginning of the conference, it's not a year long's work to do, it's 10 years and beyond. Um, but in, it's at this communal level that we're doing it. And I, we've heard from, again, we've heard from so many different people from Bob's remarks here about the power of love. And we often say at Millions of Conversations that in order to even begin the first step in the process towards sustainable peace, that first step of listening, you actually have to first let love in. And it's by when you let love in that you then are able to actually embrace that seven step journey and to go through the pain that's also involved involved in those different steps, including the truth and reconciliation. And some people say truth, justice and reconciliation process, which there's a lot of pain associated um, in that process. And it's the love that allows for us to get through it. Um, and um, just wanted to say, just say a couple of quick things um, before I turn it over to you, Mike, um, about some concrete next steps 
because we've heard that we are going to send this, um, we are going to send this um, email that can, includes all the information that has been shared across the panels and across the chat today. But I did, I did want to just say that um, for people who are interested in that local community engagement piece um, and some of those, what some people will call those soft skills, um, we we at Millions of Conversations have put together. Um, um, this uh, approach on making videos that are 30 seconds to one minute long that reach people that are not necessarily in your, um, your echo chamber and, um, and, and, and coming across the digital waves to do that. And I think that that's important too, because we, we, we need to think about, as we heard from Sabine, Sabine Malik say this in her, in her presentation earlier today, that we have these divides that are reinforced by these algorithms. Um, and we have to hack these algorithms and we have to reach the people that aren't necessarily just in our, um, our uh, physical reach, but also the cyber reach as well. And to reach them with materials that will appeal. And that's that the message and the messengers are so important there. So I just wanted to say that there is a methodology behind this that we've been studying and we've done focus groups around and um, that can help us think about how do we connect and communicate with each other to humanize each other. And I know that that's not the answer to all of it, but you do have to start somewhere if you do want to share a future together. Um, and if you do want to address depolarization and that is the goal, this is the place to start. I also wanted to talk about just really quickly in terms of like action items here, because I know some people are action oriented, like what's my exact next step? I really encourage everybody to take the pledge to listen. It is this first step in the process. And by committing to that, you're opting in to this community, um, at which Sharif also talked about. Um, he used a word, he said the tribe. He didn't say tribalism, he didn't say tribalistic, but he did use the word tribe. Um, and I do think that there's a distinction. Uh, and I then just also um, finally wanted to say, we do have something called a conversational with series. And it's about how we model these conversations that we're talking about, some of these difficult conversations that we're talking about. And how do you have like a discussion guide that helps for you to begin to do this um, in your own communities. But that's just one of many, many different things um, that, that people can tap into. And I know that some people have asked us about working groups. We have a committee um, that has organized this summit. We'll go back, we're gonna have a, uh, actually we're gonna have a debriefing session and we will talk about what these exact next steps from the summit look like and share those with you. Mike, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, I won't be. I won't be um, very long. Um, I, we are a tiny bit over time. Um, I just wanted to to wrap up with a couple of closing reflections. Um, first of all, we've had several hundred people who have been touched in some way by the content today, coming in and out. I think uh, uh, there's been some a la carte um, selection, and that has been, um, I think, to the ultimate end that we wanted, which was this is a capacity building event. This was really meant to equip people who come in contact with anything that we were doing today with more resources, knowledge, ideas, connections than they may have had before. That's apart from what Summer is talking about, which are next steps, the resources that we'll send out after this. Um, I was personally very struck by the span that we had between the macro and the micro. There was very powerful uh, visions offered and frontiers that were given, which really, in my experience, anybody's as an ag advocate or social entrepreneur or, or public servant, vision matters tremendously because it's what gives you your ideas and what gives you the energy to pursue whatever project you're doing. It, 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 the, the why um, can be the most important thing, even if it's not a technical, you know, here's what you should do tomorrow it informs your spirit and it gives you your vision. And I heard that today from Steve Benjamin to Bob, but I also heard it on the part of this summit that was about these harder specific, real hard work that government has to do about political violence, which is the most extreme part of, of, um, of polarization. So there really was a span today from the, the discussion of these, of the hard, part and the soft part. And I think that it was very fitting to end up and very powerful with, with, um, with Bob's remarks. 
there were just a few, I, I, I charted out just a few highlight. I thought Sh Shamil's remarks about the lessons that have been drawn from three, you know, three dozen countries where what's happening in the United States is not unique. It is part of their, their ways of systematically understanding this kind of breakdown and practices for bridging through it. Um, I thought that Bernadette's ideas of flipping a narrative and approaching with empathy somebody on the other side of a divide um, and rearranging the energy around attention were fascinating. Um, I thought that Rachel Kleinfeld's research and her focus on like, look, when officials in charge of the administration of elections are starting to feel personally frightened, that's a tipping point. And that, that's, a, that's a red flag of systemic failure. Um, and that's happening right now. There were so many other examples that came up during the day. And I, I, just wanted, I just want to end by saying this is a beginning as well as, as an end of this one day that we wanted to put together. Um, I hope that everybody um, throughout the whole course of the day, we have, we have a segment that's with us now, is charged up in some way to bring what you have learned and heard into your work, but this will be a feedback loop. And um, the, the major shift, I think, if there's one idea that I've gotten out of the three years of doing this work, it's a shift to proactivity, pro whatever the noun is, but to being proactive and not, a lot, not, not being um, a passive, you know, not, not floating on the waves of what we're observing, but shifting everything about who we are and what we do to a proactive posture. And that's one of the reasons I've admired millions so much and Fetzer and I think that why we've we've created such a nice partnership here. Um, so I, I just wanted to close with those thoughts, but it's really been an honor and a privilege to be with everybody here today and there will be a lot of follow up that we'll that we'll do um, after this. So thank you very much everybody for your time. And is there anybody else who would like to in the just in the want to thank here? everyone uh, personally too. Thank you uh, everyone, Bob and um, and everyone really today was, uh, I was all day taking notes and just writing notes because this is so relevant to what we are trying to do. Uh, this, uh, this work is full of nuance and complexity and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a work that's also very close to the heart. And so, um, you know, and with that, it comes sometimes to be very charged. And so how do we navigate that? How do we bring I think what Fetzer is really offering is to start with that heart and to really start with um, the deepest ground of being. And so I, I think we heard that and, and, and I was just thankful to everyone for bringing their full selves today. And so thank you. And, and to be continued, like Shamil said, I think at Fetzer, we are looking at this at five, 10 years plus. This is not overnight thing. So to be continued, right? <laughs>